What's the best way to ovulate if you have PCOS? Understanding ovulation injections. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI, so I'm a fertility doctor. And I am here to help you understand your body, your fertility, your health, your hormones, get pregnant, not get pregnant, all the above. So subscribe to this channel and follow along if you would like to learn more about your body and your fertility. Today I'm talking about ovulation induction, specifically with PCOS and discussing Clomid versus Letrozole. Now, a lot of people ask about getting pregnant and getting pregnant with PCOS because PCOS is one of the top causes of infertility. It causes irregular periods, and so it is one of those more easily recognizable signs that something is wrong because your period is irregular and abnormal. There's a lot of misconceptions about PCOS that it only happens to people who are overweight or it's due to not taking care of yourself, and those things are just false. So it's really important to understand that people can have PCOS, they can look many different ways. There are things that can predispose you or make your situation worse, but you can't change those if you don't know about it. So when we start thinking about why PCOS impacts ovulation, that's very important for us to discuss the treatment. So when we ovulate, what happens is that inside your ovary, you have a group of eggs. I always like to think about our eggs as being kept inside a vault inside your ovary, and you have a group of those eggs come out every single month. Each egg grows inside a follicle. So your brain sends out follicle-stimulating hormone, and this is FSH. FSH is well-named, and it works to get just one follicle, just one egg to grow. Humans aren't meant to have litters of children, so it's really important to have this entire group of eggs not grow forward at the same time. Even though the brain can't see what's happening in the ovary, it relies on hormones to be the communication system. So as an egg starts growing, it makes estrogen, and that estrogen talks back to the brain to tell the brain that an egg is growing. That allows the brain to send out less FSH, therefore you don't get an entire group of eggs. Now, every single month, you're going to have a group of eggs that's available, and your body's going to stimulate one of those eggs to grow. So what's interesting is that you lose more than that one egg you ovulate. You're born with about 1 to 2 million eggs, yet you only ovulate about 300, 400 over the course of your lifetime. So you have an entire group of eggs every single month that's just dying. The number of eggs available per month correlates to how many are left in the vault. So over time, we're depleting eggs from the vault. If we think about PCOS, my simplest analogy is to imagine that you are born with more eggs inside your vault. Maybe it's genetic, maybe something your mom had, maybe something she was exposed to, maybe it's something that impacted you when you were a baby inside your mom's womb, but you have a lot of eggs. And how does your body compensate for you having a lot of eggs? It's going to send out more per month. Now that makes sense because we don't hear about women with PCOS going into menopause decades later than the average person because they're losing more eggs per month. That on itself doesn't matter, except what happens is that group of eggs confuses the brain. So you have more eggs come out, the brain doesn't know this, it sends out its same signal of FSH, and that signal is not strong enough because it gets diluted amongst all of the eggs, so no egg grows or ovulates. Similar problem happens is that because the ovary gets bored, the pathway to make testosterone becomes really easy. So the ovary is a hormone making factory. It loves to make estrogen. It only really makes estrogen from eggs. It makes a teeny weeny bit from each little tiny egg, but as an egg is getting closer to ovulation, it can make these high amounts. So when you have a low amount, what is happening is that your ovary is not being able to make the hormones at once. So boom, you start making testosterone and this sets off its own cascade of problems. Acne, hair loss, hair growth, fat deposits on your abdomen or inside your organs, insulin resistance, at risk then for high cholesterol and high blood pressure, even if you're a thin person. And so this makes this circle even worse. One thing to know before we dive into the treatments real quick is that each little follicle makes a tiny amount of estrogen, like I said. So the brain hears that little estrogen and that's preventing the brain from sending out more FSH. In women who are overweight, some women with PCOS are overweight, and it's not their fault or their obesity that potentially caused the PCOS. It's PCOS that caused them to be overweight, but the PCOS makes it worse because the testosterone, the insulin resistance, the abdominal fat, and they're caught in a cycle. So you have to break the cycle, and that's why meds like GLP-1s, like Ozempic, have been so successful in doing this, because if you can stop the insulin resistance cascade, you can lose weight, guess what? 
fat cells also make estrogen. So now your estrogen is going to drop. The brain is going to say, hey, now we lost some weight. I'm going to send out more FSH because now there is less estrogen. The brain is the control center. And if there's interference in the signals coming in, it's very hard for it to interpret what the ovary is saying. So if you take away that interference, now you can get a better connection. And we know this because losing weight, if you're overweight, or even just medications like metformin or things that impact your insulin resistance can restore the pathway. And that can cause you to ovulate. So even metformin alone can help people ovulate. Metformin is a diabetic drug, and it is something used to help improve your insulin sensitivity. Now, when it comes to medications like Colmid or Letrozole, these are often needed. And I want to say this to everybody. It is no failure of you. You're not doing something wrong if you can't get your body to ovulate naturally. With PCOS, there's a lot of emphasis on eating whole foods and having your body be in a less stressful state, getting good sleep, letting your body decrease inflammation and have cellular repair. But that doesn't mean you can always do it on your own and that's okay, it's no failure. So ovulation induction is very common. The hallmark drug was Clomid. Clomid's been around forever, clomiphene citrate, and it works by binding the estrogen receptors in the brain. So now your brain says, there is no estrogen. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna send out more FSH and then get an egg to grow. Now, because it's a brain block, it has some side effects that are less desirable, such as hot flashes and mood instability, and it impacts estrogen receptors, obviously not just in the brain, but other places, like in the uterus. So in some people, you can have a thinning of the uterine lining. So robbing Peter to pay Paul, you're fixing one problem, but causing another one. Letrozole is a newer line medication, and letrozole is something called an aromatase inhibitor. What this does essentially is that it decreases estrogen that is circulating in your bloodstream. So your ovaries are still making the estrogen, or your fat is still making the estrogen, but it is being lowered by the medication. So your brain senses the drop and then is able to come in and send out a stronger signal of FSH. Clomid has been used for a long, long time. There's a famous study looking at Clomid versus Clomid and Metformin versus Metformin alone, and essentially showed that the Clomid groups with or without Metformin had such an improvement over metformin alone. Interestingly, in that study, Clomid plus metformin had the highest rate of ovulation induction, meaning most people ovulated on it, but it wasn't statistically significant from the Clomid-only group, so the take-home message was that Clomid should be used in patients with PCOS. Well, since then, we have a newer paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this was looking at Clomid versus Letrozole, and this is a hallmark trial looking at ovulation induction and getting to live birth. So there were many different parameters looked at. So this study was called Letrozole versus Clomiphene for infertility in the polycystic ovary syndrome, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a chart right here that you can look at that is talking about some of the main outcomes. So you have the Clomid group versus the Letrozole group. And statistically significant is the live birth rate, meaning people who took Letrozole over Clomid had a statistically increased probability of having a baby. 27.5% of the Letrozole group versus 19.1% of the Clomid group. When you look at this, because there was a hypothesis that this was going to be stratified based on your weight, that potentially people who weighed more or less would respond better to one met or the other, this is a really great graph, and it is breaking down Letrozole, which is red, or Clomid, which is blue, across all the different BMI ranges. So you have all patients, the lower BMI range, the middle, and the higher, and Letrozole beats Clomid across them all. So this is now the drug of choice to get somebody to ovulate. There's also been a recent study looking at odds of ovulating based on your AMH. I think that one was really, really fascinating, and I covered it in a more recent podcast episode. But what that study showed us is that the higher your AMH is, the lower the odds that you're going to respond to ovulation induction medications, such as Clomid or Letrozole. So if your AMH is over 8, what I counsel patients is we don't know for sure that you will respond to this. These are patients I think should be monitored by a fertility doctor. You should have ultrasounds to confirm you do, in fact, ovulate. Checking ovulation kit when your AMH is that high can be super frustrating, and your odds of a canceled cycle for an over response is higher as well. That is the biggest risk with these medications is the risk of multiples. It's really important to understand that PCOS is not your fault. Optimizing your lifestyle is very, very important because you can impact your outcome. You can impact the odds that you might respond to some of these lesser aggressive treatments, but ultimately you need to be more in control of your chances of getting pregnant. 
some people with PCOS will need to do IVF because it will be the safest and best option for them. It's not their fault. It's a technology that exists. And that is our job as fertility doctors to try to help you navigate. If you have irregular periods, you should get that checked. Your period's a vital sign. It should be regular, predictable, within one to two days of when you think it's coming. If it's not, please, please see a doctor. Please ask your questions below. We'd love to answer them. As always, you can get more information on the As a Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks, friends.